We're doing things a little bit different this year. We've decided to allow you guys to actually meet and to watch your documentaries for the first time. Here we go. I'm gonna wake up. It's gonna be okay. I'm gonna wake up. You can win with love every time. <laughs> you know, like, I'm not where a normal, like, 26-year-old would be. Just love. Love without fear. Mom was like, okay, guys, when I pass away, always go to a medium, and if they don't say the word pineapples, they're fake. It's like, <laughs> our, our number one word is always going to be pineapples. So I was like, Well, okay. I hope there's not a lot of mediums that watch this show, because then... <laughs> yeah. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, they're going to know pineapples now. Um, so here we are, our third hour together. We're going to close with Dave. Obviously, you are here, because Dave physically isn't. Um, yeah. How are you doing? The couch is holding me up right now. And Josh and Chanel. And Travis and Shannon and you. <laughs> Dave was a uh, very unique man. <laughs> That's an and understatement. had quite the sense of humor. I think a morbid sense of humor is one way to... Uh, we, we shared that pretty soon on after his diagnosis, yeah. I think we could use, use a couple laughs right now. <laughs> you guys ready? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Here we go. Two weeks ago, America watched transfixed as two total strangers exchanged wedding vows on TV. Dave went on TV in a quest for a bride when he aired this television commercial. Dave needs a bride. Nominations are now being accepted on the web or at the campaign office. Dave's bride will be selected by democratic process by the attendees at the wedding. He didn't have a vote at all. It was his 60 friends and family. <laughs> Dave, Dave had no say in it. What does it say about love, though? Can you make love happen? I think you need to make love happen. I mean, it's not going to go all by itself. Fell for him? Yeah. Well, no, this is a tricky question. Is it? Well, it is. is it, it is. I don't know why it's tricky. Well, there are things that, you know, you learn about people if you date them. <laughs> for longer than 10 minutes. <laughs> we had the, the champagne thing. Right. Right. I don't drink alcohol, and yep. so we did a champagne toast, and I did a total fake sip, and Dave looked at me and drink alcohol. No, okay. It's pretty intense getting to know each other, doing interviews and hanging out, and we were together the entire time after getting married. I think like two days afterwards, I said, I don't mean to freak you out, but I think I love you. The way you tell the story, by the way, is just super romantic. <laughs> anyway. I did talk to my grandma about it, and she said, well, honey, it might be the great love story of your life. And she just said it like that. I was like, yep, I'm in. I'm in. Yep. It was all grandma. My name is David Weinlich. I'm 47 years old, and I'm living with stage four colon cancer. A year ago, doctors told me I had about a year to live, but I'm not going down in a hospital bed. I want everyone to know that you don't have to live life the way the world expects you to live life. You do you. You make me up. <laughs> Dave and I could have gone on forever and been a family, just the two of us, but having kids kind of, in my mind, was the definition of family. I used to say, I didn't know what to do with a kid until they at least talked. But then when, when that happened and we had Emily, this whole new chapter of life, this whole new bundle of joy, this whole new like, person who was going to grow up and be part of our adventure and so on, that was an amazing experience. I think Dave and I, in the beginning, both of us were on the same page about having one. Who's who in the family? OK, well, we've got Emily, the free-spirited wannabe co-parent. Charlie, the strong, stalwart, supportive, helpful one. And Zoe, the 
reclusive artist, always willing to, to chip in as needed. And Zed, the exciting and, and interested and curious-minded one who, who leads us off into all kinds of other exploits. We did not experience the overwhelming responsibility that some people do when they have kids. Our life just became fun. More fun, more fun, more fun. We have a raucous good time. <laughs> Bethy is my rock. I mean, she really is. There was no the wine licks until she came along. And she's certainly concerned about what happens without me down the line. And the afternoon that we found out Dave had cancer, um, Zed and I were visiting him at the hospital. The doctors came in and they were very solemn. Zed was on the bed playing on his iPad and the doctor said, maybe he should step out. And it was at that moment that I knew. Hearing you have cancer, and I thought, okay, that's our initial diagnosis. Let's see what happens. Let's see what we can do. Maybe something's gonna go well. And honestly, then we started chemo and it also became clear that, yeah, but it's not, it's not going away. There was a discussion of, you know, one to three years. And what the heck do I do? How do I, how do I, how do I do this last bit of parenting here before I have no more chance to parent? I don't know why mommy's making waffles on her birthday. It seems kind of wrong. Well, it's also Moravian's day of giving. Okay, I'll make the waffles because it's Moravian day of giving. <laughs> <laughs> He's not like the typical dad that my friends all complain about. Like, oh my gosh, dad, you're so embarrassing. I mean, sure, my dad can embarrass me sometimes, but in general, he's just a cool guy. He's caring, optimistic, funny, and Whoa. fun. Whoa, it's on there. Whoa. <laughs> Start by cleaning up the floor. No, do, no, 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 Zed, Zed, Zed. He tries to help when he can't really do much. He still is trying to help the best he can. Thank you. Good dad, get this ball. I have the way to put the story of how they got married said maybe I should do this. No, I want to. I've already done this. Yeah, yeah so that's it. why I should it. do it. Yeah. He had his friends pitch who he got married to. He and basically put out a TV commercial and handed out pamphlets and everything like, come to the mall on this day if you want like this chance of marrying David. Because I've been in my tux since 6 a.m. The first time I saw Elizabeth that morning was actually outside those doors. I was outside those doors smoking a cigarette. Bethy and her mom pull up, and I found out later that Bethy's mom actually said to Bethy, oh, look, we pulled up and he's outside. It's a sign. It is my belief that the minute they met, that was it. Dan didn't like it much. <laughs> Oh, she told you that. Huh? I've always had a protective role of, you know, I think what any older brother has of his little sister. I had not talked to Dave ever, and I made a decision before that morning. Bethy knows her own mind. She's a smart gal, and uh, I'll just, I'm there to support her. So, it's a lot of trust to put into anybody. A lot of my dad's friends interviewed all the women yeah. and asked them questions and stuff. They sat us at a table, and it was one, two, three, four, five, and I was number four. 
I talked to each of the other four first. And when they skipped over me, I, I just, I was thinking, oh, shit. oh, shit. oh, shit. Not, not in a bad way, not in a bad way. And then they take me into the room with Dave and it was just the two of us. And he was crying. Oh my God, I'm gonna start crying. And he was crying and he got down on one knee and he said, will you marry me? And I said, yes. So I was here for seven hours. I walked in a single woman and walked out with Dave. <laughs> Best day of my life. I'm sorry. Your crib. Okay. Okay, whatever luck I had went downhill fast. Slide me those two, make them good. Yeah, I don't know. Sweetie, come on, you gotta give okay. me something. All right. Come on, here it is. Yes. Oh, that doesn't do me any good at all. <laughs> I guess the biggest thing is time with the family. I mean, it's not all capitalizing at every moment. It's not all seize the day, because there are times when I don't have the energy to seize the day, and I just feel like lying on the couch watching an episode of Columbo, you know? But we're going to keep it simple. I'm going to stay at home as long as I can. And we're also going to make it not a big medical fiasco. What were you saying? I just thought that we should talk about the service. Right. What were you thinking about talking about exactly? It's more likely that our kids will end up in therapy because we didn't have a funeral. Are they going to regret it down the line? Three of the kids don't want to have one. I don't want to have one. But then Em was thinking, well, of I'm course we have to have a yet. service. <laughs> You're not dead yet. Em Please. wants to be serious, I can tell. Yeah. It would help me to see like a bunch of the people that my dad knew. And hearing think, their stories and everything. I think we can do something informal, but I think just like feeling on display, it's a really intimate, mm -hmm. raw moment. I understand that sitting in the front, being all crying and red and puffy is emotional and raw for you, but I mean, that's what you were doing at Griffin's funeral. I think when we had the discussion, I was kind of just like iffy about it. I was kind of not on a singular side. And it's not gonna be like Griffin's because he was our cousin, but he is our dad. Yeah, it'd be a lot harder. Yeah. One thing we did talk about was possibly having service before I died mm -hmm. so that I could help out. Some people would think that was weird or that it wouldn't serve the, the closer, <laughs> closure function that <laughs> it would sorry. after the death. I'm sorry, I have to say this just to get it out, otherwise I'm going to keep track of it. I was going to say, we could fake my death, <laughs> and so have people come to the service, Did and then really I come out of the wings. Did you really just say that? I oh, come out of the wings. That is terrible. <laughs> okay, as a child, yeah. Oh, my God. This is like your no, big, know, like, I, tour I, for I, your I, new I, rock I, album, OK? Sorry. It's your <laughs> service. Right. Let's take this slightly more seriously. There's still a lot we have to do.
he has to walk me down the aisle. And he's gonna be gone. And I'm not ready. It's not just a black and white thing. I think you've already heard what I'm talking about, the fact that like, it's an openness to having something. It's just really important to know what that is and figure that out. Yeah. Who are your father's daughter? David. You were these two people doing something that nobody had really ever done before. And you were just there. I knew it was okay. I knew it was safe. Remember how I just, sometimes if I was feeling down, I would just come up to you and say, just tell me it's going to be okay. And you'd say, it's going to be okay. And I always felt better. I am afraid. Without that person behind me always saying, it's going to be okay. And I know I'll have the kids. And they're going to be such a great comfort to me. Because they're you. <laughs> they're all you. <laughs> I just want you to know that I, I believe in you. And you have the strength to do what you need to do and to hold out for the, the life that you know that you want to make with the kids when I'm not with anymore. I just want you to know, to know that I have confidence in, in you doing that. Do I get to tell you now? Right. Do I get to tell you now? Okay. Everybody who meets you, and certainly all of your friends and family, are better people for having known you. Every single person. And that's what I aspire to be, is, is a person like you. But I mean, if, if I have to go through cancer with somebody, Like, you were a pretty fun person to go through cancer with. <laughs> All right, well, that's fair. <laughs> and you're still the wine licks. We'll still be the wine licks. All right. right? We, can, we can still send Christmas cards. Yeah. <laughs> Did you tell him that about the Christmas cards? I haven't talked about the Christmas cards. Okay, we'll cards. talk about the Christmas cards. Dave has decided to donate his body to the University of Tennessee Forensic Anthropology Department. It made a lot of sense for Dave, because Dave's a teacher. And the very fact that he could teach somebody after he's gone, that was right up his alley. And we get to see a skeleton someday, which is kind of cool. Once a skeleton gets in the, in the museum, we're going to have a Christmas card with us and Dave. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's terrible. It's terrible, isn't Tell it? Tell about that. <laughs> but it's so damn funny. <laughs> this pizza needs more. What does it mean? Color. Yeah. Zed, Zoe, Charlie, Emily, wish I could give you all the guidance in the world, but I will say this, don't ever let anyone tell you that you're wrong to be the way you are. Don't ever try to be someone you're not. And in all cases, look first and be kind. That'll take you forever. Try, try and be more joyful. It's easy to get caught up in daily life and not think about that sometimes. I'll do that for him. Yeah.
So I bet you're all wondering about the Christmas cards. <laughs> I expect to get one of those, just so you know. <laughs> well, then we even went further and said that when I die, I'll donate my body to the same program so that I become a skeleton, and then we're going to be put in a case together, and we'll be the first couple skeleton in the history of the world. <laughs> That's so romantic. <laughs> skeleton, skeleton couple, I should say. That's right, right? It's so that. romantic, yeah. I love it. What gives me is just like, just the joy that you guys all have. Just the like, <laughs> I think one of the most beautiful things about the human heart is its ability to hold both pain and joy simultaneously. And like, wow, are you doing it? The fact that you can even be here, you know, and with I us appreciate and watch that because it reminded me of the joy. You don't always feel the joy, but that reminded me of it. All right, I gotta know. Did you guys have a funeral? Um, we did. You we did. did. It was okay. um, <laughs> it's just really. I think we made some people uncomfortable with our humor, but <laughs> it worked for us. Um. Speaking of uncomfortable, can you please bring bring out what you brought today? <laughs> you mean Dave? Can you bring, can you show? <laughs> this is unbelievable. I love all of you to meet. <laughs> Lego <laughs> Dave. Look at this. That's so cool. Our son Charlie made this. He's a Lego creator. And we would take pictures of him doing things and and I would post it on Facebook, and everybody just thought it was a riot. Like, oh my God, the adventures of Lego Dave. And oh <laughs> I love it. So now that. when we came to California, of course we had to bring Lego Dave. <laughs> what a beautiful way to keep him with you. That's amazing. Yeah. So we're gonna take a little break, and then after that, we're all just gonna sit, and we're gonna have a chat, and we're gonna talk, and we're gonna go deep, and hopefully leave our audience with a few pearls of wisdom. There is not anything that I wouldn't do for Bashir. If he went blind and he needed my eyes, I would be blind for the rest of my life. She's the one I chose to be with. He's my calm in the storm. Love is the great equalizer. It's the strongest thing in the world. And I'm in love and I don't want it to end and I don't want him to be heartbroken. I want to have kids and I want to have a future and a career and there's this thing that might prevent it all. You guys talk a lot about unconditional love. Your husband, who I have a man crush on. <laughs> Something that really struck me was when he talked about the moments where you feel like you have a second shot, like a second chance, like there's some relief. And he just, what goes through his mind is like, whoa, I get to love on my wife again. Mm -hmm. <sighs> that, like, how is unconditional love played into your life and in your marriage? Like he said, I, I had a, po a point where they were like, you're in kind of like a light remission. And so until we got to that period, everything was fear-based. Um, the remission lasted like that. And then he was like, now I know how to care for you. And now I know how to love on you. And I know what you need. And so I was just like, what do I need? And he was just like, "Just I'm just going to take care of you. And we love our parents, but there is something like having a spouse. Without a doubt, I would have no reason to fight. I just, he is the reason that I keep going. He's pulled me out of crash cart territory more than once. Mm. And I just, I hear his voice and I remember that's why I need to keep opening my eyes. That's why I need to keep, you know, come back into my body because like he's there. And I, my biggest fear in life is leaving him, you know. All I can say to that is ditto. <laughs> yeah. Period. Point blank. Because there are days where you're like, I'm tired. Right? I'm just tired. Like, I don't, I don't want to die, but I just, I just want to, like, not be in all of this. And then you see your loved one come in with a smile on their face or, you know, a joke that they want to tell you or something, and you're just like, Peel your eyes open, sit up, and just, like, try. 
I, I so resonate with that because there were moments where I was like, I, okay, all right, Lord, take me. Exactly. Because this is too tough. And then Bashir would come in like, babe, do you know that I saw a Groupon? We can go to Hawaii in two months. I'm like, what are you talking about? Do you see all this stuff? And he's like, I know, but they even have a plan. We're like, if we can, we can get insurance. <laughs> and I'm like, don't take me because we have to get this Groupon. <laughs> we're gonna go to Hawaii. Like, I remember at one point I was pretty out of it. And there was one point where I just said like, I could go. This could be it, and I wouldn't have to fight so hard every single day. Like, I could just be done, and no one would blame me. Like, I fought for six years. Like, I, I don't have to be in pain anymore. And, like, my eyes were closed, and I just thought about that, like, really hard. I was like, I deserve peace after this. And um, my husband walked over to my bed, like, at that exact moment. I could hear him talking to me. And I just thought, like, no, I can't go. Mm. Like, this isn't done. This isn't over. Like, he, like, when I say, like, he anchors me to this earth, like, he literally does. And I, like, he is the reason I want to be here. No matter if it's a broken body or not, I want to be where he is. I think what really um, moves me so much about what you two just shared is that um, you allow yourself to be loved. And for me, it was very, very different because I grew up being sick, so I didn't feel deserving of that. Mm. I've been in two serious relationships, and the one I'm in now, I didn't expect it. I didn't plan it. I mean, our second date was literally the ER. Like, he came to the ER when nobody else was there except for my mom, and you can't really shut out that kind of love. Mm -hmm. That means we need now an update on your love life. <laughs> Uh, well, I got married. Uh, we started filming and I was just dating. And on our first date, I just basically unloaded everything onto him. Cause I was like, well, you know, I'm in rejection. I don't know what's gonna happen in the next few months or next year. So if I'm gonna go on a date with someone, I'm just gonna tell them everything up front and see what happens. So within our first five minutes, I'm like, yeah, so I'm in rejection. I don't know how much time I have left, but how are you doing? And, uh, <laughs> and he was the first person to show up at the hospital when I needed somebody aside from my mom. and. He stayed with me almost every day up through the transplant. And so about a year after we met, we were married. Mm. And I, we didn't hesitate. We didn't, we just did what we wanted to do. What a long way from yeah. sharing with the world you're gay on TV <laughs> to being married. Yeah. Well done, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> way to dive in. He held my hand and he said, if this is how God is gonna put you in my life and this is what comes with it, he said, okay. Sometimes when I think about our family, we have the worst luck because we go through terrible things. We get through them because we have each other. Yeah. It's not okay. We are okay. I wanna spend as much time with my husband that I can. So we're in this now, now, now culture and I see a common thread of individuals and your parents are an exact example of this love that is that is almost like cemented with hardship so what's the message to those young people that maybe have never experienced hardship? i think yeah i think that we're all deserving of love and i think we're all deserving of the chance to love somebody too i've found personally that my condition has always uh strengthened the true love in my life. Mm. You know, it's very interesting when you get great news, the amount of people that come around you, and then when you get really bad news, the people that are still around you. And that for me is, has been one of my greatest lessons in this life, is being able to see that. Mm. I would say love yourself first as an individual, but if you're constantly working on yourself, and giving yourself enough love, then whomever you attract as your person will receive that and, and growing together feels so much more organic than when you're trying to like, I call it being a representative for someone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you're like, God, I just, this person's so hot and maybe if I, <laughs> like, what do I have to do? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, and, and then you get with them and you're like, you are a nasty person. <laughs> Dave, 
Um, after he got sick, he he talked about that whole thing about you know finding love and and how he had failed miserably at it because he made terrible choices and. And he said, but I realized now that I was looking for the wrong thing, what I should have been looking for is somebody who could wipe my ass and <laughs> rub my feet and give me bed baths. And that should have been my criteria <laughs> because, but I his point it. was, is that you don't go into a relationship thinking, oh, we get along really well when we travel in Rome. You put yourself in a really hellish situation and could I function with that person? And I'm, I happen to be a nurse. So yes, that came in very useful at the end like that. You know, mm. it was the hardest moment of our marriage, but it, it was raw and, and we were able to do it because of the love. But it is, it's really hard to go through with somebody. But he said, and I, and I believe he said it, that you have to choose love. Oh yeah, Dave was a big... And I love that, this idea that love is also a choice. It's an action. It's it not is. something just that you just sit back and wait that. for and yeah. watch. Mm -hmm. yep. It's something that you actively have to unfold, right? Noel and I, um, we've been through marriage counseling because we wanted to learn how to deal with grief. So we decided like as a team, maybe we don't have all the tools to hold up our house. Don't be afraid to say, hey, this is hard. We need outside help. And it wasn't like we were falling apart. We were growing closer together. I think that we also have a, have an issue nationally with admitting weakness. It is going to be really nice to get out some aggression. <laughs> you have to have the courage to look at the chest tube that they're about to put into you. You have to be able to say, OK, here we go. I'm going to wake up. He's putting up a pretty good, you know, I'm good, I'm fine, I'm OK. He's going to be a single dad overnight. I'm OK. I know my dad is putting up this, like, this wall, because right now he's trying to focus on taking care of us without taking care of himself. When we saw the documentary, I looked back, and then I was the first dad I ever saw. That was the first time I ever saw my dad cry, so I was like, um... I mean, look, you are incredibly brave and mature to be sitting on this couch at 15 years old with your mom in the situation she's in, brother. So I just want to tell you that. Yeah. That, like, people don't know how to handle this stuff. Like, no one's, like, none of us have been trained. There's no, like, life 101 to prepare you for being in the situation. And so we push it away. How important is therapy? I know you, you guys were going to therapy. Yeah, um, that's like our full-time job now, is therapy. <laughs> in one form or another. I was scared. I mean, I was very, um, not bitter, just very confused as to what was happening with me. And every other day was a new prognosis. Like every other day was, oh, by the time you're 15, by the time you're 20, by the time you're this, you're not gonna be here. And I was like, so why do I need to talk about it? Like, I don't understand that. Now as an adult, I find that therapy is a vital part of my everyday treatment. Mm. I. Um, I've learned to love myself and all of my scars uh, and deal with, you know, certain triggers. I don't know about you guys, but beeping noises for me, huge trigger. <laughs> like, oh, man. <laughs> when I hear those beeping <laughs> noises, I think hospital, and it throws me into a panic attack. So wow. it's, and I've had to have serious therapy for that. It's I'm, like PTSD from hospitals. Oh, oh total, medical PTSD yeah. is a real thing. Oh, it's and it's definitely. Um, Head, but it's a hard thing to deal yeah. with. And I think for the family too, wow. I mean, you guys deal with it just as much as we do. So I think therapy is good for anyone, but especially when you're dealing with this, this kind of thing, it's, it's necessary. I personally believe in like all modalities of healing, spiritual, emotional, physical, energetically. I'll bust out a crystal every once in a while. I have a Reiki master. I'll drink a green juice. <laughs> and sometimes I need an antidepressant. Sometimes I need an anti-anxiety. Like there is no shame in self-care. That yeah. I think is the number one mm. step on how we all have lived our lives. So where is your health today with this miracle new lease on life that you have? Um, I mean, just currently, everyone just kind of uses the word stable. Um, there's no really true remission with my conditions. Um, and since it was a clinical trial, no one knows if it will last one year, five years, 15 years. And so I'm, you know, just like working full time and living like this 
exciting little epilogue, I like to call it. Mm -hmm. um, and just hoping that if that book restarts, that it's down the line, but I know that I'll be prepared. Tell people you love them. Don't be scared to, like, tell people, so I love you. Your memories, your experiences are what you take with you. That's the only thing you get out of life, right? Gosh. <laughs> <laughs> you pour too much. Let me smell it. You're not going to like it. <laughs> when you want something bad enough, strength, hope, love, you'll find it. Thank you guys so much for being here, for flying out, for being a part of today. My final question for everybody. What do you each hope that our viewers can take away from all of your stories? What do you hope that we can learn collectively from your journeys and your experiences and your joy and your pain? You have to have patience and just find the good in everyone. Like, when it rains, just look for rainbows. When it's dark, look for stars. Just in every situation in life, it doesn't even have to be someone with a chronic illness, just Someone going through life in general, you have a lot of, a lot of ups and downs, a lot of dark times, a lot of celebrations. Just make sure that you're enjoying it to the fullest and just love as much as you can whenever you can. Wow. Your mom must be so proud of you. So many times we can talk ourselves out of things that may be the very blessing to our entire life. For, for multiple different reasons. So if something ignites your soul, just thinking about it and talking about it, go do that. Live life with purpose, forgive. And you know, just, just do whatever ignites your soul. Stop focusing on what your life could have or should have been and just revere everything that it is. And if that's the sun on your back and a planter box, that's joy. Recognize it. I guess what I want people to understand, and this seems obvious, and yet people live their lives as, as, as if it's not obvious. Your life can change like that, and truly in a second. And um, if you're on the periphery of somebody's life and something's happening to them, do not say, let me know if there's anything I can do to help. Do something. Show up at their house, clean their bathroom, show up at their house, walk their dogs, call them up and say, I'm coming to get the kids and taking them to a movie this afternoon. What you just said, I'm sorry, is so important. And I just have to scream that to the top of my lungs. I would never respond to people that would say, what do you need? Listen, if I knew what I needed, I'd be doing it. Correct. <laughs> but if you know I'm at home, laid up, and I can't do anything, if you come clean my bathroom, which I'm sure I've thrown up in a thousand times, to get up and go in and not have to, like, smell my throw up, it's like, who cleaned the bathroom? Yeah. Wow, what is that cooking? Who opened my windows? Who changed my sheets? Who washed my clothes? Right. Just do. Just do it. Just, Just do, do it. it. No one's ever going to be like, you washed my clothes? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I just, I Yeah, anything to relieve you. stress. Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. Even more so for the caregivers. I don't know when Bashir slept. I really don't. You're an angel. Never forget that. We're fighting for you. You're fighting for everything. Who's the champion? You asked, you felt last night like Dave was going to be here today and you were going to see him. I think you just saw him through her. She's got his same thing and she just channeled something right to you. Thank you. You know, there are people like us um, everywhere in this world. And if anyone is watching this who is going through something similar, I want them to know that they're not alone. I want them to know that their family members are not alone. 
I want them to know that it's okay to be scared, but it's also okay to fight with everything in you. And even when you feel tired, it's okay to lean on somebody. Mm. First of all, thank you all. You all shared a tremendous amount of your time today and your stories and your energy and your love. And, uh, and you all have a new family now. And this is the other part of this is you're not going to get rid of each other or me. <laughs> so I'm grateful for you all. And to everyone watching, thank you guys for sitting with us and giving us your time. And giving them your time. Listen, listen to what they said. Take it in. And then listen to the point where you do something. Because life is short. Life is beautiful. And life is joyful. And then rewatch all their episodes again. And share it with everybody you know. I need a group hug right now. <laughs> No. <laughs>